Go away. Dive away. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to join us last night for the learning forum, but oh, I, oh my gosh, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, it was Me? really super. Those yeah. photographs, the pictures, the explanation, his enthusiasm. He was a fabulous speaker. He was a really great speaker. It was uh, he was a biologist who has been doing work uh, understanding the whole scope of the recovery at Mount St. Helens and um that was just really interesting great great speaker so if you didn't get to see it we'll send out the recording in the uh, february newsletter it's really worth a watch yeah i thought he did such an excellent job of putting it uh in a way that we could all understand it right yeah very complex biological terms very easy to understand like i and i finally feel like i understand what happened in the in the explosion i never quite got it until he laid it together with the satellite images and that was great so and how about those elks i'm just putting that out there yeah. if you've seen the recording how about those elks right. yeah that was a good story that's a good story um so the thing with the elks for those of you who weren't on it one of the things they realized after the explosion was that a fair percentage of the elk population had lost their ears the oh. ears had been blown off um, yeah. okay back to matthew back to come back from mount st helens we are on <laughs> chapters 19 to 22 so we are near the ends my friends um, at the end of this, we are um, at the end of this chunk, we are going to be in Jerusalem. And so that'll be next week. We're going to deal with the first chunk of that week. And then the we'll finish up with um, the cross and the great commissioning. Completely unique to uh, Matthew. Almost done. OK, we've been through a lot last week. Uh, we dealt with some odd stories. Uh, this is when Jesus is starting to predict his death. It's very similar to what we saw in Mark. Um, we saw um, the transfiguration issues around taxation, where he's starting to talk about this. He's starting to get, you know, um, poked at by the temple authorities to, to give answers. And we're going to see way more of that this week. Like you said, we're going to talk about divorce, little children, the rich um, stories that we've seen before in Mark, uh, a couple parables, and he's going to continue to heal, and then he's going to come to Jerusalem. Um, and um, we're going to end with the greatest commandment, which is just a beautiful way to end. So, okay, let's start off hot and fresh with divorce. So uh, let me just go down the list and say, okay, Diane, will you read first? Sure. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another well, and marries another woman commits adultery. Okay. So, um the language in Mark and Luke and Matthew is very similar. Very similar. Matthew does something very different, though, with his language about divorce in that he includes an out clause. It is not in Mark. It's not in Luke. Matthew builds this in, right? So what Matthew has done is add a little bit of nuance to this, saying if one of the parties has been sexually unfaithful, that may constitute grounds for divorce, right? Divorce implies this freedom to marry again. So Matthew builds in kind of a escape ramp um, that Mark and Luke will not do. It'll be an absolute. 
Um, so in this, uh, Jesus is clarifying the Bible does not encouraging divorce. And remember to Jesus, the Bible is the Hebrew scriptures. So he's going to quote Genesis and the, the Pharisees are going to give them back Deuteronomy. And um, you're going to have this teaching that will flow through all of the synoptic gospels. Paul is going to take Matthew. So Mark and Luke are an absolute, no reasons. Matthew builds in a clause if somebody cheats. Paul is going to take it further and actually say you can divorce if um, your partner is not faithful, if they're not a Christian. So Paul will even build that in. Um, and what is happening is setting up this Christian norm of lifelong marriage. Um, I'm going to show you just this. So this second phrase, haven't you heard that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. So that is, I can't remember the name of the group, but it's the moms, uh, the very conservative moms who are now organizing to show up at school boards happen in my town. Um, and this is the scripture that they quote to undo any transgender protections for bathrooms. This is what they quote. And um, I, I hear it almost at every school board meeting. It's part of kind of the playbook. So this is, they're pulling this piece right here out of Matthew, which can be very interesting because I want to show you something next. So Okay, um, the disciples said to him, this is the situation between a husband and wife. It is better not to marry, right? I mean, if there's no getting out of it, why would you marry, right? Um, so they're having second thoughts now that they know it's a lifelong commitment. And again, Paul's going to expand on this. And the, the basis for the Christian relationship moving forward is going to be this lifelong marriage. Okay. Um, let me read this one. So this, this piece goes on to say this. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are Enochs who were born that way, and there are Enochs who have been made Enochs by others. And there are those who choose to live like Enochs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. This is a passage that is really now um, uh, being understood as an example of gender diversity, right? So this, this whole passage in Matthew, the beginning is the one that conservative cite to remove all transgender bathrooms, right? And deal with that. The second part of that passage though, is a passage that has now been kind of embraced um, as an example of gender diversity. So, so Enix um, mm. were people who were assigned male at birth and then had their reproductive organs either changed or removed prior to puberty, right? But at that time in the ancient world, that word Enoch could also mean intersex, meaning they could be either male or female, right? So um, what... In particular, trans biblical scholars are now doing is looking at this passage and um, looking at it as um, how it may apply to transgenders, individuals, not because of the things the Enochs in the scripture experience are talks about, but because the experiences of the Enochs are very similar to transgender and intersex people today in our culture, right? discrimination, oppression, and dehumanization, right? So this has been a point of dissension for Christians for centuries over what this passage means. Um, so regardless of what it means, what's very clear is Jesus does not denigrate them like others in the society may have done. Um, and beyond that, he actually lifts them up as a positive example, right? So um, an interesting take on a scripture passage that's being taken by conservatives and by liberal um, liberal groups. Okay, um, let's go on then. Chapter 19. And this is, oh, go ahead, Paul. So I wondered if this was where they got the idea that priests in the Catholic Church should not 
um, Mary. So oh. that's that's actually going to really be developed with Paul. So um, remember how it's like absolute no divorce. Matthew adds in the little escape calls. Paul is going to say you could get divorced also if you don't have faith. But Paul's really going to elaborate on that um, preferential um, preferential opinion towards um, um, celibacy. Celibacy. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's going to all come from Paul. Okay. Any other questions on that odd little divorce pack, Kama? It's very much in alignment with um, Jewish teaching prior to this. Okay, um, let's go on and deal with a story that is also in several of the, uh, all of the synaptic gospels. So Chris, will you read this one? Sure. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Yes, yeah, story that um, very, very common in the synoptics, right? So this uh, rich man isn't, isn't just asking about how to go to heaven after he dies. He's asking if he will benefit when this kingdom of heaven, God's rule comes to transform everything. So he's asking like a two part question. Um, and he wants to know if he's going to gain life in this new age, right? This is very often misunderstood as eternal life. Um, that's something that's been read back into it, right? So when he says, um, so he's telling him, what do you ask? What do you want, right? What must I do to get eternal life? So that that is a, um, a translation that's reading that interpretation back into it. He's wanting to know what what's a what's he going to get? What's the benefit to him to do all this, right? The standard answer for the Jewish community and for Matthew's community is the Ten Commandments, right? Keep the Jewish laws. Remember those Ten Commandments we went through. Um, and then Jesus is going to set another one on top of that. And he's going to basically say all of that, what you always knew, and then everything I talked about in um, the Sermon on the Mount. All of those ways to be completely different in the world with our actions and complete dedication to that service and living out. Okay, and again, that's a very, very common sermon, um, section. You've heard that before, which is an, the same as this one. We're in a very um, almost verbatim replication of Mark in this section here. So uh, Shirley, you want to read that one? When the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. 
Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, we, we have to really work with this one, especially that last sentence. Okay, so um, James and John are the two, and their mom come to ask for a promotion, right? <clears throat> Um, so in, in several of the, the gospels, it's not quite clear who's coming and asking for the promotion. Um, uh, sometimes it'll say the mom of the, the Zebedees and sometimes it's silent. Um, so, um, think back to early Christianity, the center of early Christianity leadership right post Jesus was in Jerusalem and it was James, which was the brother of Jesus, and then Peter. So that is how that leadership started in Jerusalem. James and Peter are dead by the time Matthew has written. So you could kind of wonder whether or not this is a post-Easter story of kind of conflict in the communities. But this is a story that's in all of them, this kind of buckling for power and joshing, jostling for power. So the, the disciples still think that this they're going to be rewarded for following Jesus, and that reward is going to be greatness and power, right? And he's going to cut it off and say, no, you got it wrong, right? And th remember, last week, he already told them this with the little kids, right? If you want to learn how to lead, look to how you work with the most vulnerable, right? Um, and they still aren't getting it, so they're gonna. He's gonna ask it again, um, and he's gonna emphasize what he's offering is not greatness, it's not privilege, it's not power, but this kind of new life. So, the normal way, the way that they understand it, the way the Gentiles understand it, is this kind of power and hierarchy, right? And um, and it's a really, really tough sell for the disciples. In Mark, this is where Jesus gets really angry at them for not getting it. Like he really throws a hissy fit at them for not getting it. You can see it's kind of softened in Matthew, which um, the farther you get away from Jesus's death, the, a little more positive the disciples are viewed. So um, it's, it's not absolutely not the hissy fit that Jesus throws with this story in Mark. It's a little softer. But they are still craving power and uh, they aren't getting the fact that their job is going to be actually to be something radically different in the world. OK, so let's deal with this last sentence. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. OK, that sentence um, for centuries has served as the basis for atonement theology, theology that Jesus came to die for our sins, um, to redeem humanity because of the sin of Adam and Eve, right? So that's that's atonement theology, the belief Jesus died for our sins. Um, now you all know I don't I don't believe that it's I it's it, that that's a concept that was developed about 300 years after Jesus died. Um, it's really flushed out with Augustine. Um, the word ransom here really means, oops, wrong way, um, liberation. This is this is a statement about liberation. Um, so um, it's not a payment, which is what it will be fully developed into. Jesus' life paid in turn in return for our sins being cleared. When you see the word ransom, uh, think liberation. That's a, a more truthful interpretation. It's not atonement for our sins. Okay, uh, let's go on with chapter 20. And just want to make sure everybody good with that one. Anybody want to talk about atonement theology or all good? It, it, I, I can ask you, um, don't I understand correctly that 
most all the Christian churches really do believe in atonement theology? Um, I, mean, I, it, I, I don't, and it's one of the things that's always bothered me. Yeah, it's a predominant Christian understanding within the Catholic Church, within the evangelical um, Protestant um, arms, um, Southern Baptist, I would include in there. Um, in um, the more progressive denominations like the UCC, like the ELCA and the Lutherans, because there's a very conservative Lutheran and a, a, a more progressive Lutheran in the ELCA um, and within the Methodists you and within the Episcopalians, you see kind of a, a setting that aside. I'll just add one quick thing, because this has always bothered me as well. Um, there's really no church, like if you consider the Catholics as setting dogma, they never set a true dogma of the atonement. And so there are over seven theories of the atonement floating around out there. Bottom line, it's squishy. It is. It is. And, uh, and a lot of atonement theology is going to be read into Paul. Um, and I think a lot of it is misunderstood, uh, the Jewishness of Paul. And kind of Paul uses some sacrifice language. But that was a very Jewish way to think about the religious um, life. And we, we and people throughout the centuries have read into those kind of a different understanding of sacrifice and lamb than uh, what the Jewish authors probably intended. Go ahead, Marie. It, it's, it's in a lot of our hymns, in our hymn books. It is. Yeah. Yep. And I would say the kind of dismantling of this and going back and looking at what the earliest Christians believed and practiced um, and which, you know, the, the cross was not a symbol of Christianity for several hundred years. You don't find it in the earliest arts. Um, it really was that the cross theology came hundreds of years later. Um, and um, so earliest Christianity in, in terms of what they believed about Jesus, it, it had more to do with this uh, gift of new life and the, and the kingdom through those um, acts of service and love and community. And then it really was Augustine that was kind of the death knell um, in Augustine's writing. Um, and, and Augustine has just been, um, is just so elevated, particularly within the Catholic Church, that uh, that's, a, that's been a pretty intense legacy. Okay, all good on atonement theology. Just be real cautious when you read it on words like lamb, ransom, sacrifice, and be real cautious about what, what you think they mean and open to kind of considering that might not be what it is. So, okay, let me pull this back up. Okay. Um, this is Jesus's kind of last healing before Jerusalem. So, um, Steve, do you want to read this one? Sure. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The cloud rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so um, it's an interesting exchange because Jesus wants to know exactly what do they want. And um, Jesus doesn't make assumptions. Um, Jesus um, responds based on their needs and requests. 
Um, they don't ask, they're not asking for money. They're asking for anything material. Uh, they asked for the one thing that really mattered, which was their sight. And he touches them and they can see. When that happens, they leave everything behind and they follow him, right? So this is, I think, Matthew's attempt to show an example of true discipleship, right? That when our true needs are met, there really is no other route than to follow Jesus. So kind of going, thinking back to that story of the yoke, that when we align with that kind of path of the way, um, it really does just lead towards God. This is the last thing Jesus does in Matthew before he heads to Jerusalem. He's going to heal. And I think that's a, a pretty telling one. Okay, we're going to go from there into Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. I'm going to skip that part. And uh, instead, we're going to go right to the money changers and the temple. So, um, okay. Paul, do you want to read? Sure. Um, I did have a question on the last one. Yeah, when, go. when they said that they followed him, were those over and above the 12 disciples or were those part of the 12 disciples or what? Yeah, he's got, I think you could probably assume from all of the gospels that the longer he's on the road, the bigger the group is that's with him. So we know the 12 are with him, but we also have all these different stories about people giving up their lives and following him. So that group is growing larger and larger. And then throughout the Gospels, especially in Luke, you hear about the women who are also traveling with him. So um, I think of him as like a, a giant traveling circus. Like there's a lot of folks mm -hmm. moving forward with him. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never, have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And they left him and went out of the city of Bethany, where the where he spent the night. So in in almost all the gospels, like gospels, he doesn't he doesn't stay in Jerusalem. So he's in there and out. Um, so we're into Holy Week now. He has come in and um, he is uh, in Jerusalem. And the most logical place for him to go and teach and preach and heal is. The temple right um which is what he's been doing in every town he's gone to he goes to the synagogue um matthew's kind of passion his holy week is not laid out as clear as mark if you can think back if you've read mark mark will be like on the first day he did this and on the second day of the week he did this and this so matthew is not that clear about the sequencing of the events but the events are going to flow very similar to what you've seen in Mark and in Luke. So um, he goes to the temple. And um, this is one of those stories you got to be real careful about not having an anti Jewish lens on it um, because it, it could easily become an anti Jewish story. And it's not. It's not. Um, here's the deal with the temple we know that um, in 6 CE, um, Rome took over from. Um, one of Herod's sons. He was so incompetent, Rome took it over. So remember when Herod died, there was a fight, three kids, one each got, they divided up. Well, the one that was in charge of Jerusalem was horribly incompetent. Rome stepped in, got rid of him, and put in a prefect, right, who we will meet 
very soon as Pontius Pilate. That uh, prefect uh, lived um, out on the coast and then would come into Jerusalem whenever there was the potential for crowds or high holy days to keep the peace, right? So um, the temple, the central place in Jerusalem, um, had become the central economic and political institution in the country. And, and it was also the center of this local collaboration with Rome. The temple was ruled by a few. It was a system of economic exploitation. Um, so again, these, this was a people that, was, that were horribly oppressed, economically oppressed. And um, yet they still had to pay this temple tax, right? Um, so the very few who ruled at the top of the hierarchy within the Jewish society at that point were the temple authorities. So you've got the head priest and a few aristocratic families, um, and they were large landowners. This very tiny 1% lived in luxury while the 99% um, were destitute for the most part, right? Okay, so the obligation of the 1%, uh, and I'm totally making up the percentages, but just so you could get the sense of it, the, the obligation of that tiny minority was to make sure the money kept flowing to Rome. They had two jobs, money keeps flowing to Rome and the peace is kept, right? Those are really, really critical. Um, and so the temple was the center of the local and the imperial tax system. So that's really, really critical context to understand why he did what he did. Jesus overturning the tables is in all four gospels. And that, that number is very small of the ones that are in all four gospels. Um, so the folks who are selling things. So um, if you can kind of picture the temple of old, the folks who were selling things were out on the perimeters. And uh, if you were coming to the temple to uh, do a prayer request, you would have, uh, as part of your pilgrimage, you would have to buy the animal that was going to be sacrificed. Maybe it was a bird, maybe it was a lamb, whatever you could afford, you would buy that out, one of these vendors on the outside, and then you would bring it in for the sacrifice. There's nothing in any of the stories that suggests these folks were doing anything other than what they had been doing for a long time, which is selling the animals that were needed for the sacrifice at that point in time. So nothing suggests that they were overcharging them or scanning them. Jesus is quoting from Jeremiah in here, this den of robbers things, and he isn't referencing the sellers, the folks who are out there um, selling these animals, he's referencing that 1%, the temple leadership, that they is are the den of robbers. They have become the corrupt religious collaborators with this Roman imperial rule. And that wasn't what the temple was intended to be. It was intended to be a house of prayer for all nations. So we don't know what makes him angry with the situation, right? Um, but he does what he does with the money changers, the same way, same thing he's doing with a lot of the traditions that he's encountering. He's turning them upside down, right? He is not trying to take over the temple by force. Uh, he's not making a statement about the money lenders. Again, he's, he's probably objecting to taking advantage of folks and this whole temple system of dominance and oppression. So this temple incident is basically the death knoll. So this in all the gospels um, is where the, the real high level folks start to get worried. They, they now know he's there and he's causing trouble. Uh, he's coming to the attention of the high priest and of Pilate. So remember, uh, the prefect, Pilate, lives out on the ocean, out on the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, again, will only come in when it's a big kind of celebration, holy day. So uh, it's Passover, there's a lot, a big Roman presence in Rome to keep the peace, including Pontius Pilate, the prefect. Okay, regardless of the incident itself, 
somehow Jesus doesn't get tossed out. He continues to teach and heal at the temple, and he does it in all the Gospels. That that temple story is not the end of the story. He flips the tables, and then he goes right into teaching and healing in all the Gospels, right? Um, and he's focused on healing the blind and the lame, folks who have been left out, folks who are now welcomed and seen. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, this is uh, this is where he's starting to get, um, I guess, targeted by those in charge. So, um, Marie, do you want to read? Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? And they discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't we believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, uh, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Okay, so they really want an answer to one question, which is, do you think you're the Messiah? Um, because be Jesus is acting like he's in charge, right? Um, and they want to know under what authority basically, are you doing this? And he's not going to answer them. He's going to give them a really vague answer. That theme is going to continue throughout the week, this kind of challenge. And he finds a way to subvert the question and um, that you're going to see rising and escalating um, intentions towards bringing him up on trial. Okay, let's do one last one. Uh, hey, Marilee, I think this is one of your favorites, so why don't you read this one? Oh, you're on mute, Marilee. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Okay, so um, Jesus starts with that first part. He's quoting Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and he's pulling together the great commandment, love God, love our neighbor. Um, that is, um, if you look at kind of the totality of what Jesus is kind of preaching, a pretty radical message, uh, because to love God above all else means giving to God what belongs to God, our heart, our souls, our minds, our strength, um, everything we own. That means they do not belong to Caesar, right? So it's it's a political statement as well. To love one's neighbor as oneself means refusing to accept those divisions that are rendered by the normalcy of that ancient civilization and today, right? Uh, it's refusing to accept that which divides us. Um, respected, marginalized, righteous, sinner, rich, poor, friends, enemy, Jews, Gentiles. It's so much more than that, right? Okay. Okay, before I go into the kind of question for reflection, let me just stop and check in. We're deep into Holy Week now and kind of the Jerusalem drama that's going to lead us to the cross. Any questions on what you've seen in Matthew? Go ahead, Bernie. <clears throat> Well, I just don't understand why in 2115, all of a sudden, children are introduced. <clears throat> they uh, they refer to the ch children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna. And so is there a significance that children 
have to be mentioned there? No, and I'll I'll look up the cross reference on that. I do think that's unique to Matthew. So um, in some way, Matthew probably wanted to connect that back to kind of those other key moments, um, tying Jesus's ministry intent to the little children. Mm. That would be my guess. And I'll, I'll confirm that, but I'm pretty sure the little kids part in that piece is unique to Matthew. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Do you hear my dogs? They are snoring in unison. They are so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's our here's the question. I'm going to give you a little time with. It's the great commandment: love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it: love your neighbor as yourself. Very simple question for reflection. What is the most challenging part of living into this teaching? What is the most challenging part to live into that? Get you set up and I'll send you out. Okay, I'm gonna give you about eight minutes to do that one. The Great Commandment. What's the most challenging aspect of it? Okay, I'll see you back here in eight minutes. Welcome back, your prompt group. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, what'd you figure out? What's the most challenging of that? All of the above. <laughs> Go ahead, Marie. What do you got? There was well, there was three things. Uh, I don't. I might be misinterpreting or misreporting, but Bernie said, "Well, we have to define God, and that's hard." And Shirley said, well, what about being loyal to your country and and recognizing that there are national things that you need to do for your country? And so that sort of isn't in that commandment. So where is it supposed to go? And uh, I said, well, I just often think that I know much better than the, my neighbor. Who, and then Diane said, well, Everybody in the world is supposed to be our neighbor. So, so I would say there were at least four things that were hard. <laughs> okay, who else? Good summation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. How about the other group? Well, I think the first part, you know, love your God. Um, is focusing on on connecting to what's important as opposed to uh what you whether or not you're achieving success mm -hmm. and when you know what's important then the second follows you know which is uh being good it isn't what we do to make us successful but what we do to help others that's important in life mm -hmm. I don't know. 
So I think, I guess the first is more important than the second. I mean, the first comes first and the second comes second. Yeah. Are, are you could argue that they're a continuous circle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Together, right? It's a, it's all about you know the same things as the uh, Becky's doing with her spirituality and the mystics. Yeah, that's what the mystics are is trying to keep and get in touch with God. And what's interesting is almost all of them say be aware of the here and now. You know, be be here now and not mm -hmm. thinking about you know what your success is or anything like that. But mm -hmm. what do you feel here and now? Yeah, I I, I can't. I can't help but see um, the religious far right is using it as a cudgel for why they don't need to obey the inst follow the institutional uh, rules in this country. Hmm. Because their first, their their primary is to uh, God. Aim is to love God and not Rome. Yeah. Yeah, I think you could probably imagine that um, being said. Absolutely. Well, what about that second part of that commandment? Yeah. Yeah, they don't you get to hear, that. You don't hear that quoted all that often. <laughs> I haven't got there yet. <laughs> okay, I want to share something with you. Um, so this is, Bernie, your question. So this is uh, 21 13. So this is the cleansing the temple. So here's here's where it looks like in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew takes that chunk of Mark and he's going to add to it. Um, Luke is going to kind of go on a, another little tangent. Um, but so then, so this is the question you had, Bernie, about the out of mouths of children and nursing infants who prepare praise for yourself. Where does that come from, right? It yes. comes, this is a good um, thing to remember with Matthew, is it probably is coming from the Hebrew Bible. In particular, this one, he's quoting Psalm 8, verse 2. So Matthew has just um, built in a citation to a psalm there. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And then um, I wanted to show you... The um, go to one seventeen. So is it? It's one of Matthew's, as it's written the book in the scriptures. <laughs> yep. So not only is uh, you know he's he's um, talking about the scriptures being fulfilled, he cites them a lot. So that's him citing it. So this yep. is the the divorce one, and you can see how much Matthew has kind of uh, riffed on this one, right? Um, so um, not, not so much the first part, um, but definitely the second part. So the um, male and female, right? Luke doesn't, Luke doesn't move it forward. Luke is just gonna move forward the piece on the divorce teaching. Matthew is going to take that from Mark and then he's going to add that kind of escape clause about how you what's it acceptable. And then Matthew is going to add that whole other piece on the Enox. This is why I love this tool so much to really give you an idea of uh, what people did with kind of the source document um, and then where they diverged. So this is a really good example of um, kind of an interesting take on that. But you know, I love me some Bible, so I find it very interesting. Okay, we've got two more pieces left. I think we're uh, 19 and there's only six chapters left. So we're doing 23 to 25 um, next week. And if you wanna read to the end, feel free to see kind of the whole end of the picture. Um, but yeah, 23 to 25, and we have two more classes, just two classes in February, and then we'll take a two week break and come back with the Marys. Then we'll take, I think, a two or three week break, and we'll be back with the book of Revelation. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a really good one. So, okay, everybody good for the week? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll Bye. see you in a week. Bye.